We'd like to welcome you to the March 3rd, 2020 board meeting. And um, do I hear a motion to enter into executive session to consider employment recommendations for 2019-2020 and employment recommendations for 2020-2021? Madam Chair, I move that the board enter into executive session to consider employment recommendations for 2019-2020 and employment recommendations for 2020-2021. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. And we will now adjourn to executive session. It is now 7 o'clock p.m. and I'd like to welcome you to the March 3rd, 2020 school board meeting. We want to welcome all of you tonight and thank you for coming in on this terribly dreary rainy night. I, I don't think it's ever going to stop raining, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, do I hear a motion to conclude executive session and begin open session? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries and we are now in open session. I would like to call to order the general session of the March 3rd, 2020 board meeting. I would like to alert you that the district is in, in, in compliance with the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act. We have notified the media of the date, time, and place of this meeting. We would also like to notify you that the district does take this meeting for accuracy in preparing the minutes. And at this time, I'd like to call on Dr. Kyle Guyton to lead our invitation. Dr. Guyton. Please join me if you feel led. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. I, I thank you for uh, the people to my right, the people to my left, the people in the audience who are, are intimately concerned with the well-being and the, uh, the just health of our children uh, and our community. And just um, I thank you for, for their participation here and, and just what they do on a daily basis. Furthermore, we pray for, for Mike, who's out tonight, and, and just uh, uh, as he recovers from, from his surgery and that uh, all goes well. And obviously, we're in a time of fear right now. Uh, we, we have a, a lot going on, not only here, but, but within the world itself, and it, it causes us to take a pause. And so we just we ask for your guidance and your direction so, uh, so that we make the best decisions possible. Amen. Thank you, Dr. the agenda as presented. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding the agenda board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Uh, board, we have, uh, we have reports and action items from executive session. Uh, there were no recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year. Do I hear a motion to approve 22 certified recommendations for the 2020-2021 school year? Madam Chair, I move the board accept the uh, 22 employment recommendations for the 2020-21 school year as recommended by Dr. Little and the senior leadership team. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the 22 certified recommendations for the 2020-2021 school year, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries and it is unanimous. Do I hear a motion to approve one certified recommendation for the 2020-2021 school year? Madam Chair, move the board accept the one certified recommendation for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments regarding the one certified recommendation? I believe that motion may be incorrect. I think it's an administrative position. I think you are right. Let board, let's redo that. Do I hear a motion to approve one administrative recommendation for the 2020-21 school year? Madam Chair, move that the board accept the one administrative position for the 2020-21 school year as recommended by Dr. Little and the senior leadership team. Thank you, Dr. Powers. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Are there any questions or comments, board? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, and good catch, Ms. Green. Thank you. Uh, board, in front of you are... Uh, 
let's see, we have another action item. Do I hear a motion to approve nine student travel requests as presented? Madam Chair, I move that we approve nine student travel requests as presented by administration. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Oswald. Are there any questions or comments? This is usually this is not in this position to vote. That's why it feels so strange. But we don't have action. We don't have awards and recognition tonight. So we're kind of jumping way ahead. It does feel funny to be talking about this so early. Uh -huh. um, but um, oh, it's not in my thing. Okay. I need the verbiage, uh, Ms. Layton, for the citizens' participation. I don't have a copy of that. Unless it got, I did drop this. It might have. Okay. Excuse us. We got a little waylaid on our agenda here. So we're going to now go back to, we're going to go to 7.0, which is citizens' participation. And I'm going to read the guidelines because I do have three cards. So if y'all will give me just a minute to get the guidelines so that you'll understand the parameters around this section. And then we'll move from there. Thank you for catching that. Pretty much know it by heart, but I don't want to guess at it. Yeah. Board, we're going to skip ahead while we're waiting on that. We're going to start with, um, uh, we're going to go to 9.0, which is the superintendent's report, and we're going to go to 9.1, which is the su superintendent's update, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Little while we wait for that other information. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and I'm sure we'll start on citizens participation in just a moment. Um, just today, I, I wanted to um, just remind the board that we sent out a, an email regarding um, the COVID-19, uh, otherwise known as the coronavirus, uh, and about what we're working on. And I uh, just wanted to update the board that in the morning we'll be doing, our, our custodians will be getting together to have uh, a meeting, uh, and we'll be discussing uh, ways that we just continuously clean common surfaces, uh, door handles, light switches, um, those types of areas. Uh, Miss Wood will be there as well, um, and so uh, we're going to have, a, a, I think, a good conversation in the morning just about what our current practices are and, and uh, what that looks like moving forward. Also looking at things like uh, having conversations about school buses and uh, weight rooms and um, that stuff as well. And then um, also just wanted to, we've, we've received lots of questions about field trips and um, so one of the things that right now there's really no domestic um, restrictions about field trips. And so it's really our, my inclination at the moment that we're going to, uh, my recommendation is we're going to continue to follow uh, very closely the news. Uh, we just voted on some more student travel requests as well. Uh, but we're going to continue to follow closely with the CDC and the World Health Organization. Anytime there's a travel um, restrictions and those types of things, uh, do that as well. But we are in communication. Dr. Talley uh, today has, has given me a list of field trips that are coming up for the rest of the year, uh, some of them in the international variety, some of them in the domestic variety. Um, I, I know as a parent, I know we share this concern. Um, my daughter has a field trip or a field study on March 18th. They're going to New York City. Um, but right now, there's really nothing um, that says that they can't do those things. Um, but I would also remind parents and, and remind our community that uh, that can change uh, just because we're that way now uh, as of uh, today's March the 3rd. Um, we know that March 17th or April 1st or uh, May 5th or whatever it may be could be very different. So uh, we're just going to continue to monitor. And, uh, and also on Thursday, I'll be meeting with the, um, our state meeting with superintendents, and we'll be discussing this as well. So I, I will probably have some even more uh, feedback after that meeting. So... Um, 
again, that's kind of where we are right now. But, uh, but I just wanted to give that update to everybody since that has been a question that we've received a lot. Um, that's all I've got. So if you want to go back to citizens participation. Yeah, well, I, then... I do want to make one comment there. Um, the board, and <coughs> in, in, since I've been on the board 20 years, we have a uh, callback. We've twice called back uh, uh, students' field studies that we have approved. We call back field studies after 9-11. Um, we call back some international trips. Um, and then we also call back, I think you all may remember about three or four years ago when they had the terrorist attacks in Paris, we call back some field studies that were going to France. And um, I, I, we have had questions from parents regarding uh, refunding money for those trips, and um, that is not in the jurisdiction of our board. Um, these, these trips are scheduled through contracts, and so each trip has its own contract, and they're going to work within the contracts. That being said, we're going to do our best to see, you know, what we can do, either postpone it till the this coronavirus thing has run its course, or just seeing what we can do. But we. The board has always said that um, up until the point that you either close the door on the plane, train, bus, car, um, we reserve the right to pull back on those trips if we feel like the safety and security of our students is in peril and the staff. Um, because the staff, you know, when they agree to uh, serve as chaperones, they take on a lot of responsibility. So just wanted to let you know that that's, this is not a first time event. Unfortunately, it's just a different reason for um, uh, analyzing the student travel. Did anybody, any board members want to add anything? Okay. I, I guess my only comment is obviously we need to vet our decisions with the State Department and kind of guidelines Correct. so that we're not operating in isolation. Absolutely. So. That, that, that's what we're, we're following CDC's website currently. Uh, we, we do have had, we've had some international trips already canceled. Um, but like, like one of those was to China, uh, there was one to Northern Italy, and so both of those have already been canceled, but it really at the moment is a case-by-case -case basis. And then also our parents obviously ultimately get to make the final decision with their child. So, right. Uh, exactly. Okay. We are now going to go back to 7.0, which is citizens' participation. And the Lexington County School District 1 Board of Trustees provides a time <coughs> for citizens' participation at each regular board meeting. There are a few guidelines, of course. <clears throat> First, in order to speak, you must be a parent or legal guardian of a student in Lexington County School District 1 or a resident and taxpayer of the district. Second, you will have three minutes. Third, you may comment on an agenda item, school operations, programs, policies, or other matters of concerns. However, you may not speak about specific individuals, whether students or staff. There are other ways to bring situations like that to the board's attention. Um, we want to give everyone a chance who came to speak tonight an opportunity for, for you to speak. For that reason, board members may not reply to your individual remarks. And if someone makes the point or points you came to make before you, if you could just state that you agree with the previous speakers and not restate every point, that would also help us. We also ask that you not clap or make any comments, either while an individual is speaking or after a speaker finishes, as that also slows down the process considerably. If you wanted to speak tonight, we ask that you fill out a card um, that uh, gives us your name and address for our records. Those cards were on our sign-in table as you came into the meeting. If you have not filled out a card and still wish to speak, hold up your hand, and our communications department will provide you with a card. Okay, right here. What one right here? Okay, so at this time, I'm going to call on Ms. Martha Gilman. She is going to discuss our school drug testing policy. She lives at 3, 328. 328, Ms. Gilman? 328 Churchview Loop. She is the mother of a student at Carolina Springs Middle School. Okay, Ms. Gilman. Hi, good afternoon. Today, um, my son was kicked off of the lacrosse team because I signed your Lexington drug testing policy and I requested to be present during the drug testing because I found out that your school district is extracting DNA swabs from children's mouths. You have not provided any information about the company processing this DNA. You have not described how their data collection is done, how it's 
disposed of, how it's tracked, if the student's name or ID number is affected, if they are selling the information to 23andMe or any other entity. I also, based off of your generic incomplete school policy, gives me no information about who you're using. It doesn't give me any information about the company, what their processes are, or how they even control the student's information or identification to these DNA samples. I pulled up another policy for another school district, which actually clearly outlines that other parents have the opportunity to be present when their children are DNA tested. However, none of y'all's policies even come close to being adequate or thorough. So with that being stated, I signed your policy. I requested to be present. But actually, your white and old athletics director called me today and said, you, the board, rejected my request to be present with my 14-year-old son while your school actually conducts a medical procedure on my son. My second point is they're not using your urine. They are using your children's DNA from their lips. They haven't told us anything about the company. Ms. Gilman, you're supposed to be talking. You're talking well, to us. I if you don't mind, I, we can't hear you when okay. you turn around. So, so you haven't even remotely provided any parent with how that DNA is being protected. Are they selling it to 23andMe? Are they using my son's information? for genetic testing? Are they storing it for whatever reasons they want to? Why are you not using urine samples? Why would you use a minor's DNA to drug test? All you should be drug testing for is illegal drugs. I actually contacted Gregory Little today and. He did not return my call. I actually spoke to your White Knoll Athletics Director, which I won't name according to your policy, and he absolutely denied that my son could participate, even though I signed the form. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gilman. Your time is up. I also would like to provide evidence that other school districts give parents the option to attend their drug testing. Okay, thank you so much. I am requesting that immediately my son be put back on the lacrosse team tomorrow. Otherwise, I feel like this is a civil rights problem. Okay. And it is a civil rights okay. violation. Thank you, Ms. Gilman. We're gonna go ahead and I think your husband's speaking next. So unless he want, do you wanna defer to her? Okay, great. Okay. At this time, we're going to call up Bob Gilman. He is going to talk about our current drug testing policy. He is also a parent of a rising ninth grader. He's, um, I think, related. That's your son. And he resides at 328 Churchview Loop Road. Okay, Mr. Gilman. That's right. Uh, I'm going to, first of all, say I agree with my wife's comments. Sure. Just... Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna, I agree with my wife's comments. I just wanted to add a couple of uh, points. I do believe that the policy itself is um, not thorough. It's, it's weak. It lacks a lot of specificity that other policies include. So I'm asking that the policy be looked at. Okay. I don't know the date of the policy either, but there was a point in time where this board, and fully aware that a lot of the policies were not updated. In fact, many of them had been uh, old and been, had not been updated in a number of years. So I'd like the policy itself to be looked at. Number two, I really want to emphasize this one point. 
Martha agreed with and signed the form for Matthew to be able to participate. And then he was kicked off the team because she simply asked for what I would say reasonable accommodations to be present. That's okay. all. This is not... Um, this is not an unreasonable request. It's simply you're present when your child is tested. And Matthew, who you see sitting right here, this kid was so excited, and the coach was so excited to have a rising ninth grader be interested in the lacrosse team, only to be surprised by the phone call that, no, you can't participate, even though you've agreed to the policy. So we're simply asking that the policy be looked at hard, be much more specific, allow reasonable accommodations, and the policy actually spell out specifically, as Martha said, what are you doing with the information? How is it being disposed of? We all are sensitive to our personal information being protected. There is no language in the current policy that speaks to that. It's very void. So please update the policy. Please reinstate this kid to play lacrosse, and it's just a reasonable thing to expect. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Um, Dr. Little, would you like to have Mr. Caldwell call them tomorrow or um, we'll and go over that? Okay, great. We'll have Mr. Caldwell, who's over our student affairs, touch base with you tomorrow and kind of walk you through that policy. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. We well, no, I know that, but walk, th walk through your concerns and answer your concerns. Okay, at this time, um, I'm going to call up Ms. Billy Garris. Uh, she's going to talk about field trips, and uh, Ms. Garris lives at 207 Centerville Road in Gilbert, and she's a senior at Gilbert High School. Billy? Good afternoon, Chair Smith and board members. Um, I'm not going to speak long because y'all just hit on this, but um, I have an upcoming field trip, and at school today, all the kids were talking about the possibility of their field trip being canceled because of this coronavirus. However, I'm asking that instead of canceling the field trips, that you give parents the option to send their children without district's approval. It's my understanding that in the past, parents have been given this option. Thank you, and I hope you would consider my request. Okay. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Okay, and now we're going to call on uh, Jamie O'Neill. She's going to talk about a TriDec audition request. She lives at 140 Whisper Lake Drive. Um, she is a, has a student at Northside Christian Academy, and... Um, Go ahead, Ms. O'Neill. Good evening. Thank you for your time. Can you hear me? Can I call my text? Look on, yeah. Hang on, we'll bring you some, some technical support right here. Absolutely. Good evening. Thank you, board, for hearing me. My name is Jamie O'Neill, and I am the uh, mother of three students. Uh, the student I come to speak to you about, her name is Mary Scott O'Neill. She's my middle child, and she's a very talented artist. I've been in contact uh, with TriDAC as she is finally getting to the point where she can uh, take advantage of such an amazing opportunity. Um, that Lexington One District offers. It's TRIDAC. They have visual arts, creative arts, um, theatrical arts, as you know. So I um, called as a mother and uh, nominated her in January, January 15th, to uh, please allow her to audition. I am not requesting her a spot. I think it depends on her own merits, but I have been denied for her request to audition. And the reason they're stating is that she attends a private school. I've been in touch with Kelly Rooks, Ms. Rooks, who's the TRIDAC uh, representative here I don't, uh, in this um, district. She forwarded the email. Um, so I, I spoke with her. I emailed her. Um, I got a response February 19th that stated that Charter school students, homeschool students, and Lexington One public school students are allowed to audition. However, we choose a Christian-based education for our children. And there is not a public Christian-based education for my babies. And so therefore, I forward her a, a lengthy email with all due respect, wondering why we are being persecuted for our choices 
in a private school setting uh, when homeschoolers, charter schoolers, and everyone else that I uh, aforementioned has the opportunity to uh, audition. She said that she would forward it. She uh, forwarded it um, on February 20th to the Chief Student Services Officer. It is March 3rd. I have yet to receive a reply. Um, the audition is coming up on March 7th, and I believe that it is, it is just simply not okay that my child, my daughter, doesn't have an opportunity to explore her artistic, God-given talents in such an amazing um, uh, forum during the summer. She's not one that can go and spend the night over, she's not an overnight camper. Um, we've tried that and it just doesn't work. Uh, therefore, I've just come to you as a mom and as someone that I just really don't understand why homeschoolers get the opportunity, charter schoolers get the opportunity. I am an equal serving taxpayer. I own a business in this town. I pay plenty of taxes and I'm not requesting for her to have an automatic spot. I just simply request the fact that she gets to audition and be either approved or denied on her own merit. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. And in addition, sorry, quickly. Beautiful. They don't have these opportunities in these Christian schools for, for, I'm sorry, they don't have the opportunity for my daughter to excel in order to gain governor school artistic um, opportunities in this school. Thank you. I'm sorry. And like, here's a painting, and she does several different um, methods, but I've, I simply, request that you please reconsider this and I look forward to a response okay. and thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate I it. have Dr. Tally contact yeah. her tomorrow. Okay, we'll have Dr. Tally right there. She's in charge of the educational side of our district. We'll have her contact you, Ms. O'Neill. We'll give her your information. Thank you. We appreciate you bringing that to our attention. We appreciate all of you bringing those issues to our attention. Okay. We are now going to, let's see, let me make sure, let me look at the real agenda and let's see what I'm skipping and missing. 9.2. Well, no, we've got to go back. We didn't vote on the student travel request. Yeah. Okay. okay. We, um, we've already, we're going to go back to 8.1, which is a motion to approve eight, uh, excuse me, let me put my glasses on nine student travel requests as presented and I had a motion from Miss Green and I had a second from Mr. Oswald and we were just opening it up for discussion board so let's go back and open that up for discussion. Um, do I have any questions or comments at this time? Okay. Um, and I, I did want to respond to something that Billy Garris said. Um, we have in the past had that situation and it you know it's up to your parents if they want to take you on that trip. Um, it, it wouldn't be if if a trip is canceled that would be up to your parents so we did have that happen with the Paris trip we actually had parents take their kids to Paris um, but it did not go through Lexington one so that is an option and I appreciate you bringing that to our attention so we now have a motion and a second on the floor um, all in favor of the nine student travel request as presented by Dr. Talley please say aye aye any opposed the motion carries and it is unanimous and we will continue um we're going to go to 9.1 which is the superintendent's update did you have anything else on the update dr little or you want to go straight to no, the e-learning i'd like to go straight to e-learning because this is going to be a, a pretty substantial conversation uh we have with us tonight uh mr howard bissell who has been uh working on this and uh collaborating with our teachers i believe since um september october and uh and has done quite a bit of work with a lot of our advisory councils and uh, he is here tonight to um, talk about what he's learned and, and uh, what has been created and we'll kind of ask for a request I believe at the end of this. 
Thank you, Dr. Little, Madam Chair, members of the board. I present to you for information this evening a proposal to take part in a pilot program uh, made, uh, made possible through the South Carolina Education Oversight Committee uh, for e-learning days in Lexington District 1, which would essentially give us the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to conduct uh, teaching and learning on days where we may need to cancel school for inclement, inclement weather or, or other, uh, for other reasons. Um, so talk, just starting off, uh, talk a little bit about why uh, we, we would want to consider this proposal. Uh, it allows us to leverage time, space, and place with the technology and access that we have available to us in Lexington One. E-learning days would provide us a great deal of calendar flexibility. It would allow us to eliminate weather makeup days as we're structuring our calendar. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the type of impact that that can have on, on teaching and learning uh, in, in the, in, through the duration of the um, uh, school year. And it also, uh, maybe most importantly, gives us continuity of teaching and learning when the district is forced to cancel school on those particular days uh, and thinking about uh, the time outside of class um, when those days, when those cancellations take place, um, we have some, some systems and structures in place that would allow students to maintain their, their pace of learning in their, uh, in their classes. So um, up to this point, as Dr. Little mentioned, um, our Teacher Leadership Council had, had started in the early fall actually investigating this and really dug in to consult with some districts in South Carolina uh, who were involved in the first two phases of the pilot in October. Uh, they, they did a good bit of that research and also co connected with some districts outside of South Carolina in Pennsylvania and, and in Georgia. We've had the opportunity to um, have some conversations uh, with the SE Education Oversight Committee uh, and, and talk through their, their guidelines for the for the pilot and for their uh, their approval of applications and we've also had, a, had an opportunity to talk to a, a lot of, of stakeholders uh, parents teachers students principals central service leaders and as we talked to all of those groups um, we've heard uh, a widespread support in favor um, of this proposal uh, with some uh, entirely valid questions along the way about what the logistics look like and and, and how this would work uh, there is a URL there for a, a live frequently asked questions page that you can access. I believe we made it available in your, uh, uh, in your board packet as well, but uh, we'll very soon we'll have that posted and available on our website so that um, uh, we can, that can be public facing and, and transparent for, for everyone who might have some questions. And we'll continue to add to that as we work through some of the logistics. So you might be asking, what are e-learning days? What does this look like? So essentially, in the event of a school cancellation, students and teachers are going to engage in meaningful learning experiences at home instead of burning, essentially burning that day and, and having no teacher and learning happening uh, in, in the middle of a week uh, or in the middle of a quarter or, or semester. All the other employees in our district can engage in online professional learning opportunities or alternate assignments so that there's not a break in their work week or their pay schedule. Uh, so this has an impact on, on everyone within the district. Um, knowing that there are going to be some contingencies and there may not be the opportunity for everyone to engage on that particular day or days, we have a five-day grace period built in for when students and teachers return from school to, to, to leverage uh, some supports at the school to, to make up for that work. And then uh, we'll talk a little, little more in depth about how we can eliminate weather makeup days from the district's academic calendar and the impact that'll have on, on our students and uh, um, teachers. So how will it work? We're looking at targeting uh, grades four through 12 to make digital assignments and resources available through our learning management system uh, resources. Uh, primarily, that's Schoology in grades six through 12. We also have access to Google Classroom that's used in um, a number of different classrooms. Either way, it's a way, uh, it's an opportunity for teachers to post resources and assignments and uh, structures for learning and students to access that and, and process digital workflow so that these things can happen, um, uh, you know, online in a, in a digital format uh, instead of face-to-face uh, -face and, and through paper and pencil. Uh, teachers are going to establish uh, online office hours to support and monitor accountability for students that are submitting. Uh, so essentially, a, a teacher's working through their day um, on, on that day that we might be canceled. They're just doing it online and providing support to uh, students uh, as they go and as they have questions. 
Um, so if you're looking at it from the, from the student perspective, um, the students in grades four through 12 are going to access materials uh, through those learning management systems. They're going to engage in that work. If they have questions, they'll be able to reach out directly to the teachers. Uh, and again, there's a five-day window once we return from school in case something wasn't quite clicking during that day or um, they, they weren't able to, to access uh, the internet, uh, whatever the, the case might be. There's, a, there's this kind of gray area that we can work in to make sure that those, all the students have the supports that they need. Um, the accountability for it is, is attendance. So if the students complete the work that they're, that they're assigned for that particular day, they're, they're marked present. Um, and if they don't, then they're marked absent. And so the, their method of accountability then is, um, is, their, is their attendance for, uh, for that particular day or days. Um, so in, in 4 through 12, we, we have the ability to leverage technology to do this. In grades 4K through 3, we don't have, uh, the technology in those grades are not as abundant, and that's, and that's by design. Uh, we feel in Lexington, one, that uh, developmentally at that age, we need students that are not working in a one-to-one -one environment all the time. Uh, but we will have assignments and engagements that are meaningful for these students. Uh, they'll just be made available uh, through a, a paper and pencil format. Uh, all of the resources will be available online and, and, and digitally, uh, but we'll make extra accommodations for those students so that they're able to work uh, um, and, 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 and have a meaningful experience in an interdisciplinary fashion and, and hitting all the different subjects that they, that they would see and, and interact with on a, on a daily basis. Same five-day window applying to, to our younger students in those primary grades. When we talk about other uh, employees in the district, um, we're, we're looking at providing the most relevant options that we can for them to make up for the time that they're not working that day. You think uh, someone who is um, working, um, you know, an, an hourly schedule, uh, this will allow for, uh, for there to be no interruption in their pay, and they'll be able to work through and work some extra hours within a finite period of time after that cancellation, so there's no disruption there. Uh, a number of our certified employees will, will also engage in some, in some extra hours to make up for it. We'll also have a, um, have a nice repository of online professional learning that folks can self-select into um, and take advantage of that time to maybe uh, do a little bit of professional development that they otherwise um, you know, may not have the time to, to engage in. Um, if you look at the, um, the, the, um, the spreadsheet there, this is something that we that we were looking at that was uh, produced by another district that had, had been through the, the first or second phase of the pilot. And there is a, a list of all positions in the districts in that, in that A column. And then going across row one up there, those are the different options that they might select into uh, in order to make up the time for that day. So everybody's accountable for that day of work, even though they're not physically in the buildings um, or, or uh, you know, in their um, uh, handling those specific daily responsibilities on that particular day. Um, this uh, probably looks a lot better on paper, but the, the, the intent here is that you see that there, there is a sequence for, for each of these groups of stakeholders. Uh, and, and once we operationalize this, it'll be, it'll be a fair, it'll be standard operating procedure. Um, at the notice of school cancellation, teachers will know that they need to have work posted. Students will know that they need to go in and take a look at what they have going on and make a schedule to be accountable for what's happening there. Um, parents, um, you know, they'll be aware of what's happening happening here and, uh, and, and, and hopefully hope checking in with students along the way to make sure that they're sticking with that accountability plan. And employees are going to select the options that they have available to them to, to be accountable for the work on that day. Uh, it'll probably be mo most intensive for teachers on that day who are managing assignments that are coming in, questions that are coming in, and, and, and really keeping track of the student work and, and correcting um, you know, some maybe misconceptions that they're seeing happening. I would envision that a teacher in a middle school or a high school may provide some type of a text for students to engage with and then ask them to participate in a discussion board on that day. And uh, they may respond to a particular prompt based on the text that they read or the video that they watched and uh, interact with some of their students. And then the teacher can be there in that online form, providing some input along the way, uh, really giving students a great opportunity to prepare for the types of teach or types of learning that they'll be expected to uh, engage in when they leave K-12 education. So we talked a little bit about the calendar impact that this could potentially have. 
I uh, mentioned earlier that um, this this concept of of, uh, of e-learning days allows the district to create more frequent natural breaks in the calendar. Um, so if we look at uh, where we are right now in the in the spring 2020 calendar, we have uh, right right on the other side. Uh, I mean, we can almost see it, smell it, taste it. it there's the there's this break that uh, that's coming up in March. Um, that is going to be much needed for especially our, our youngest students, um, but I think for all the folks that are uh, in our schools working so hard each day. Uh, I do have highlighted there February 17th. Uh, that's just a couple of weeks ago. That's actually a weather makeup day that we had to make up uh, because of a day that we had to take for weather back in the fall. So you can see there if we were able to um, have an e-learning day on that day that we canceled in the fall, we would have been able to provide uh, students with four days off there in February. Uh, and then not even just a, a month later, four additional days. Uh, we've got that weather makeup day built in on the 12th there. And then coming up in April, that 13th, April 13th, the Monday after Easter, that's a weather makeup day as well. So, you know, knock on wood, we won't have to uh, initiate any cancellations between now and then. We'll be able to maintain those breaks, uh, which we know from uh, stakeholder feedback over the past couple of years are really important to, uh, to, to our kids and, um, and, just, and just staying fresh. Uh, there are some other considerations there. Um, when you go for a very long stretch of time, you see um, attendance issues arise, um, and you see leave being taken from, from teachers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we look back at, at what happened last year with some of the weather makeup days. But I think another important point to make here is that these frequent breaks that are built in can create natural bar barriers to the spread of illness, particularly during uh, cold and flu season and in these spring months when we have uh, had these weather makeup days built in. Um, uh, you know, the typical gestation period for influenza is about two days. So um, our director of nursing explained to me very, very, very nicely and concisely that if you have these, uh, these three or four day breaks built in sporadically um, and naturally, uh, they, they form naturally, natural barriers in the calendar. So that if a student were to say, become infected with influenza on a Thursday, if they're coming back on a Friday, they might not know it and they're coming back to school, but they still could be passing that, um, that virus around. Uh, so not a medical professional by any means, but it makes sense if you have a couple of extra days when those things are floating around in schools uh, for students to be home and not there um, mixing it up with, with other kids, it's going to cut down on the, on the spread of illness. Let's take, um, let's take a look here just real quick. No, I'm sorry, those are the, I'm sorry, I highlighted the, the, the makeup days that we still have if we don't have to cancel there. So you can see where those natural breaks would be brought in this year still. If we had e-learning days in, um, in place, we wouldn't have to worry about having to cancel those. We know we have them. But let's, let's jump back to, to fall of um, 2018 real quick here. If you remember in September of 2018, Hurricane Florence um, came through our coast, maybe not here in Lexington so much, but uh, along our coast. And then not even a month later, we had Hurricane Michael that came through. So we had five days that we had to cancel uh, in, in the fall of 2018. Now we had those weather makeup days built in, three of them at least. But I want to take a look at what that spring looked like for us and, uh, and think about what that could have looked like if we had e-learning days in place. Now you see the blue circles there are weather makeup days. We had one built in on February 18th, which would have been a four-day weekend break, natural barrier for students. We had one built in on March 15th, which would have been another natural barrier and a break for students and teachers. And then April 22nd, because we had the five days of cancellation in the fall, what ended up happening is we had to come to school um, on the 18th, on the 15th, and on the 22nd, but we also had to add a half a day on the 5th of June the 6th of June, and then another day for teachers on the 10th of June. So if you look at the time there across that calendar, there really aren't a whole lot of natural breaks for, for students and for teachers for that matter. And if you go back, really the last time there was a, an extended break would have been the beginning of January. So you see there's a, there's a real long time there before you get to spring break. That's a pretty long push, especially for, for little kids. Um, and, and there's an impact on teacher attendance as well. Uh, on the 18th of February, um, we looked at uh, teacher attendance and I believe it was, there was 236 
leave requests that were put in on that particular day, um, just ju just for uh, to, to build a break in there. And as that push came through March and April and, and May, even we we saw ranges of 230 so up to about two or 400 and 430. So you got a lot of folks that are that are putting in leave at that time, uh, just because they need some natural breaks built in there. So we're thinking about what our next steps will be. Um, if, if we're able to move forward, we know that uh, one phase is providing the overarching structure. There's a lot of logistics that we need to dig into, and uh, a lot of them focus on providing professional learning and support for folks in the school to make sure that they're comfortable with handling this type of learning. Uh, we know we need to establish points of contact at each school to streamline that communication, and we also know that the, the curriculum, the content, the resources, the lesson templates are going to be critical to making sure that everything is uh, delivered in a coordinated manner within those schools and also consistent across the district. We know we need to provide meaningful professional le learning resources for our non-instructional folks. We also know that in grades four and five, where devices don't go home, we need to understand where our pockets of, um, of folks are without access at home so that we can make um, the appropriate accommodations for them to have access to devices if needed. Um, Communicate, communicate, communicate. This is a, a, a fairly large program um, and, and implementation. And so touching so many stakeholders and having an impact on so many stakeholders, we need to make sure that everyone's in the know and has access to the information that they need and the questions they need to know about. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we spoke to a, a number of um, advocacy groups uh, in our district, principals, teachers, parents, um, students, and uh, we've, we've got some pretty good feedback. Uh, again, some questions here or there about what if this and what if that, but uh, at the end of the day, folks are really recognizing that what this can do to, to flex the calendar out is, uh, is a definitely a positive for, for both teachers and students. Um, and uh, the, the calendar flexibility in general is a, is a high spot, but, but really I think what's driving this home and, and, and making people uh, really, really get excited about implementing this is the continuity in learning. You know, if we had to cancel school for a day or two, you've got folks that are on, on a track and they're, and they're, they're trying to, to get to a cer certain point in their curriculum and, and achieve some very specific learning targets with students. Uh, they don't have to just take a pause and lose all that momentum in the middle of all of that. And, and ultimately, that's really the most important thing here because that's what affects kids uh, most directly uh, with this initiative. Okay, so to wrap up, pending uh, local board approval and uh, SC uh, Education Oversight Committee approval of the district's application, e-learning days will go into effect this coming August 2020, uh, and the uh, Oversight Committee will notify the district when they approve our application by the end of this school year. We'll have that submitted by, by mid-April. Okay, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Do we have any questions? I have a couple. Anybody want to start? I'll start. Um, I know that this is kind of in a perfect world, and this is like when the governor says we're going to shut the schools down because we're going to—they're going to be uh, sites for the hurricanes, and we don't lose power, and we have running water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know, like last night in Tennessee, when they have the that tornado came through and devastated Nashville. Um, how do you incorporate like a sudden event like that? I mean. It, that's not really designed for e-learning, is it? Yeah, well, it, it, it can be, okay. it can be. I think we, we find the, the biggest challenge with our, with our younger students, okay. um, particularly because of um, where we're, we're very tech heavy, uh, where, where it's appropriate in mm -hmm. grades six through 12. Uh, in grades uh, 4K through through five, uh, they're not taking those. They're not taking devices home every day, right. right? And so, and they're not the teaching and learning that they're engaged, engaged with in the student engagement model and the workshop model is not tech heavy focus. And so, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a curve there to, and that's where a lot of our professional learning will have to lead in this spring and, and, and throughout the summer. Uh, but the situation that you describe for grades six through 12, that's what's what they're doing on a daily basis. So, what if they don't have power? Yeah. That's what I wonder about. So very so so great point. So there's really nothing we can do about that on that day. And really, where we where we've seen success in districts that have gone through the first two phases mm -hmm. of the pilot, and thank goodness there's been two two phases of the pilot mm -hmm. to work through some of these things. It's that it's that five day window to 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 have some leverage when students come back and there is power in the school and there is internet access in the school and there are supports and 
um, and, and schedule structure that allow them to engage in some of those things they couldn't get to on that day off, that's where they, they take advantage of that time and, and make that up. Okay. And that kind of segues into my next question. I know we held back and we did not go through the application process because our district is so large. We wanted to hear from some of the smaller districts and let them come up sort of with the pros and cons. What, what pros and cons have we heard from the test sites that are applicable to what what we're going to do in, in sure. Lexington One? Yeah, great question. So uh, the, some, some of the pros are that what we, we spoke about earlier, the, the consistency and in, in instruction and teaching mm -hmm. and learning, they're not having to, to break that up and step mm -hmm. back and take a break and then try to get charged back up again mm -hmm. when they come back in. Um, also uh, a huge uptick in teacher collaboration um, and, and really in pulling together um, in their everyday planning and ownership over the students because they have the situation in front of them and then they realize how they can, how they can leverage digital learning in some different ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's really pushed the professional learning and mindset of teachers in those districts where before it was really kind of a, an option, I guess. So if they wanted to go that route with the way um, the way that they ran their classroom, they saw the, the benefit of that uh, in these other districts. And it, it's changed the way that they've, they've approached um, instruction with their students. What cons have you heard? Yeah, so cons, I think, some things that came out of not knowing what you don't know. Um, one was coordination among teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there, there was a pilot district where they, there was some negative feedback because students were working the entire day because uh, in, in order for the, the, the teachers to provide work that they felt was meaningful, they provided more than what would really actually need to happen in a, in a day or in a block of time or in a period. And so those were some quick corrections that districts made when they realized that students were getting loaded down with work that actually exceeded the time that they would even be in school on that day. Okay. So I think a lot of logistical things and uh, just the ability to coordinate within the school and, and we're looking at providing some very specific templates to help teachers think through what it is they're providing and some suggestions like if you are facilitating an e-learning day, Leverage your normal schedule on that day and, and plan for uh, engagements with students that would take about the amount of time you would see them and then make yourself available on the time that you would have a planning to be available to them. I, I mean, I hate to think about it, but if the coronavirus, if, if we had to take off a couple weeks of school to kind of get the virus to clear out, what have they, has anybody ever set the time frame where it is sort of the, diminishing returns where it's just it's just not productive after x amount of days it's you just can't do e-learning indefinitely yeah. i guess like that yeah I, th I think that's a very real thing uh, to, to consider um there there will be diminishing returns and so it doesn't mean that you can't do it but mm -hmm. even to think for an extended amount of time learning in a, in a distance model or learning from home you're, you're never going to be able to replace that type of interaction with the teacher and with mm -hmm. the and with the peers that you'll have at the class so i i haven't seen anything to this point that puts that quantifies we don't it don't know quite yet that because puts i a imagine most yeah. of our sister districts it's only been a couple of days that they practiced i mean that they've done this right that's right that's yeah. right and so um so generally speaking if you're thinking about inclement weather, you could say we're, we could be prepared for five, uh, and that's probably not going to happen altogether. It, it might, but if, if you're, it's a much different construct if you're thinking about um, a, a situation where you're out for 14 days. For, 14 days. So the, the base structure is, is a good structure for any type of um, e-learning implementation. The dynamics change a little bit when you're, when you're talking about what you do for an extended period of time. It's kind of ironic that you put this on the agenda, what, three or four months ago, not knowing what we would be dealing with. It's kind of perfect timing. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, and I guess I love the idea of this. Um, I would probably be a little reluctant to have a calendar that didn't have any makeup days on it. Yeah, um, and I've wondered if, as part of this model, has there been discussion about, so you've got an event that happens um, unexpectedly, and at 4 a.m. we get a call from Mary Beth Hill saying there's no school today. And we, you know, and that's happened. Um, is there any thought of having a couple of weather days, weather e-makeup days in the spring where the students stay home, but it's an e-learning day to make up for a day that there was just no way to get galvanized to make, you know, a, an unexpected day off matter. And so sure. you defer the e-learning day to a, a hold, you know, a place marker in the spring. 
Yeah. Does that make it, sense? It, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And, and, and doing the research, there's actually two approaches that you can take to e-learning days. One would be the, the, the one that, that we're talking about here where you conduct learning on that day and you build in the days into the spring, but they're not weather makeup days. They're built in as school holidays. Um, and so you can build in the three that you have there and, and take up to five in the fall. The other way that a school district could approach it would be to say, we're gonna have school canceled for a hurricane or whatever in October. And then we're gonna we're gonna designate that day in the spring to, to make to make that day up. The problem there is, is one, you lose the opportunity to build in more frequent breaks for students, as we talked about earlier, which is, is significant. It makes a significant difference. Um, and and the, the other piece of it is, is that you, particularly on a high school schedule, if I'm losing a day in a semester course in October, when I'm making that day up in, in April, it's not doing me right. any good. I'm basically just getting the extra day. So when you think about what, how that actually plays out, you really get Get, uh, get twice of twice of a bonus, I guess, if you take the first model because you're able to maintain the continuity up front, okay, and then you're also able to be very purposeful about building in the extra time in the spring when you know that there are going to be a significant number of absences due to illnesses. Okay, because I'm just thinking, like, you know, if for the 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 younger students, like you're talking about, if you don't know the day before that. This, this, there's going to be no school tomorrow, yeah. then there's no way to provide them school to do. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just, I'm wondering if there needs to be like a worst case scenario day in each semester just for those, probably unlikely, but just in the event that the e-learning day doesn't happen as right. planned. But I, I do think at the grade, the elementary level, the teachers could still email like a PDF. Again, they have email addresses for the parents. But I think that goes back to we have students that don't have Wi-Fi at home, um, and that's just part of a, a bigger picture with yeah. um, accessibility in some of our you know more rural areas. So I, I will say um, our our core content coordinators are working very hard now on putting together materials and resources for students that will be relevant at any point during the fall if we were to have a can cancellation. Um, so the curriculum there is less specified than say if you know if I were if I were moving through a U.S. history curriculum. Um, if you look at what the the ELA math science um, uh, social studies standards are in elementary, the work that a student can do there is is really based on reading comprehension and. Uh, uh, numerical fluency and and those types of things can be um, extended at any point without having to necessarily be the next thing they were doing in class that day particularly particularly in elementary the instructional models there would be very difficult to replicate outside of school anyway so uh, a lot of that curriculum and content would be extensions of the skills that we know we're working on in those particular grade levels and they would have access to that before or they could access it online but th those would be paper copies that would go home early and earlier in the year knowing that they would still be relevant at any point during the semester with a cancellation. Uh, it, with the the best practices that you have seen with other districts, financial impact, did they talk about net neutral, positive, negative, one way or the other? Um, from an operational standpoint, I have not gotten into any, any of that data. Uh, there has been some investment in uh, profession, professional learning and just capacity building for, for practice, um, establishing some, some leads at grade levels in different schools, and, and those, are, um, those are basically just um, annual stipends. Um, but uh, we, we could look in to see if there was any type of a, a net gain or neutral from an operation standpoint. Okay. And then second question, you, the, the five, specific to the five-day grace period, how does that modify upcoming school days? So, you know, if, and I assume if it's a stretch of three days that you're out, for example, with a hurricane, mm -hmm. the five-day grace period is not at the end of the last day. It's specific to each day. Is that correct? So it's so basically a rolling five days if they're continual days. Essentially, the model that we're, we're proposing for our initial pilot uh, application would be five days for the first day to, to begin upon return, and then subsequent days would add a subsequent date of the grace period. Gotcha. And then, so, so what does that look like for the student on, on kind of the granular level? Does that, does, are there certain programs throughout the day that are maybe cut? Uh, during that time to fill in with the, the learning that should have occurred on the day that, that they were out? Is that what that looks like? Or? 
um, in, in the event that a student would not uh, essentially keep up uh, on, on those days when they're out, there is flexibility built in in different ways and in our different grade bands. Uh, and in all of our high schools, there's time built in through the sure. day where, where students work through some independent learning time. And most of our middle schools, it, it, they're called different things, but there are structures built in there as well. And in our elementary schools, again, that's the challenge that doesn't, it just doesn't align up with the way we do business in six through 12. So that would be where we take a look at how we can provide some some added time to help give the kids the individual support that they need based on where they are when they come back in with those expectations. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Ms. Gilman, this is for the board. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not allowed to ask questions. I'm really sorry. You, Mr. Bissell will be available at the end, and you're more than welcome to talk, Absolutely. or one of us. So. Okay. You can ask him after the meeting. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good question. Sure. So, Any other uh, questions for I think Dr. you Powers? said this, but there's no additional hardware costs, and then the software platform to support this is in play now, right? So, there's no additional. Okay. That's correct. So, it's just further um, faculty development for our teachers and how to leverage that online platform. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other questions, board? Ms. Garris? Yeah. Um, Along the lines Ms. Gilman was talking about, what are the plans for special education? Yeah, so there, there, are, there are very specific accommodations that go into place um, in individual education plans and, and 504s. Our special education department is putting together a plan for students that are enrolled in those specific, specific programs. Um, specific service hours, they are telling me that those are, those are, those are weekly requirements, uh, and so they can work within the schedule when we come back to provide some of those things. But they feel confident that um, the, the majority of the services that are, that are provided can still be provided under under this plan. There, there will be some where there uh, uh, will have to be different accommodations provided. The, the specifics of that would, we can make available. We've been having those conversations for about, about two and a half months now to make sure that we have all of those bases covered as well. And again, really exemplars from other districts to see what they've done as well. Again, it's a, it's a great position to be in in a, in a third year of a pilot to, to learn from some of the work that other folks have had to go through in other districts. Do our special ed students have one-to-one -one technology in the older grades? Uh, so special ed's a pretty broad um, category. Uh, there, there are students that fall under the category of having IEP, and yes, they, have, they absolutely do. There are some other students with other designations with, within the program um, that I, I believe they, they may not take those devices home. And so there are some of the accommodations that our special education department is working on for uh, an event like this or an implementation like this. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bissell. That was wonderful. Thank you. And um, we'll definitely be in touch. <laughs> so our our plan moving forward is um, we're going to come back. Uh, some of your questions, uh, I believe we have those recorded. Um, and so Mr. Bissell will come back to us on March 17th uh, to fill out any other questions that you might have. And, uh, and then part of the rubric um, is actually if so the superintendent supports it there's so many points if the superintendent and board chair sign it there's so many points but then if the board votes on it you get maximum number of points and so we're, we'd like to bring that back to you on March 17th um, for a vote and uh, so Mr. Bissell will, will give us a little more information about spe specifically I think Dr. Guyton uh, your question about um, the budget, what that might look like, if there was any other question that uh, we have. So if you have some questions over the next couple weeks, uh, if you would please email me them, and, um, and I'll make sure that they are answered in full on the 17th as well. Okay. All right, next, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, as you know, as we enter March, we... Um, uh, we also begin that uh, that fun part of our season called budget season, and so uh, just for I think we have a, a fairly quick um, thing tonight just to give you an update about what's coming down um, over the next couple months. Thank you, Dr. Little. Uh, members of the board, yes, um, I, I will be brief this evening as we'll get um, much further into the budget conversations over the next few months. Um, but I, I did want to kind of lay out a, a schedule for you and just give you an idea of what's going on. 
uh, with the budget. So this time of year, um, and actually we started a little bit earlier this year than we have in the past, but January, February timeframe, um, we're doing enrollment projections and we've reviewed those with our, our principals. Um, we're looking at, at staffing formulas. Our uh, human resource department, Mr. Stacy and his group have, have worked really hard to come up with some staffing formulas. Um, and so we're working with schools on those formulas. Uh, we're also looking very closely at classroom space. As you know, we're in the middle of a building program. And so uh, sometimes we, we need an additional teacher uh, and we have to get creative about where that, that classroom space uh, can occur. So we're working through those issues. Um, and as an SLT uh, senior leadership team, we're uh, discussing the major budget priorities uh, that we see coming forward for this year. Um, now into March, um, our schools and departments are working on their budgets um, and we will begin reviewing those um, as a senior leadership team and preparing uh, budget recommendations for the board to review. Um, we in, in our, our finance uh, department continue to monitor the budget process at the state level um, and work to project revenue, um, not only from the state, but, but also uh, from our local um, county revenue. Um, you may be following some of that now and you've seen that base student cost is um, anticipated to, to go up about $11, but there are some strings attached to that. Um, the board is required to um, pass a policy that uh, restricts the use of personal communication devices in a classroom um, if they're not um, deemed for classroom use, i.e. a cell phone. Um, uh, if, if we aren't using those in our classrooms for student inst or classroom instruction, then the board has to adopt, adopt a policy to restrict um, and limit the use of those in the classroom to get that $11. Um, it is tied to, currently tied to an anti-bullying proviso um, as part of the, the budget process. So, yes, ma'am. And Mr. Southers, just to clarify, the base student cost increase is what covers the district's cost for step increases for staff, right? Uh, that's part of it, yes. Yep. So that those increases are important, and $11 is insufficient, but tied to phone use is probably not an appropriate restriction. It, it is a unique um, situation. Uh, I don't think we've seen these, these kind of limitations before uh, related to um, to that. And so, and and we've had some conversations. The you know the cell phone policy in our district has uh, been revised uh, numerous times over the years and evolved uh, numerous times over the years. So it's an interesting uh, connection that's being made. Um, and of course, base student cost is still not. Um, funded at, an, at a level that's, uh, that's appropriate uh, for the expenditures of, um, I'll just say all South Carolina districts. I'll go out on a limb and, and say that. Uh, I think it's pretty safe. Um, obviously also we're monitoring um, the allowable millage limit increases. Uh, you're familiar with Act 388. Um, the Office of Revenue and Fiscal Affairs um, will set that millage inc increase um, here at the end of this month, most likely. That's based on CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index, and then your growth, your local growth percentage within your district. Um, and so that basically sets the number of mills that a, uh, a board uh, can increase or levy on um, on uh, debt service and, and well, on, on 6% um, and 10% property owners. It does not affect um, homeowners because you, you do not pay um, property taxes for school operations um, in South Carolina. And so moving forward to April, um, April we're going to have our first reading of the budget. Uh, that's with the, that is at the April 21st regularly scheduled board meeting. Um, and so we have in the past had like a separate budget work session, but we have brought those two meetings together and do it on the regularly scheduled meeting, um, hoping that, um, you know, folks will be used to us meeting on that day and we'll, our attendance will be um, be good for that, that first reading. Um, May would be our second reading on the regularly scheduled meeting on the 19th. And then third reading um, right now is scheduled for June 16th. That's your regularly scheduled board meeting. I'll just go ahead and tell you that's a little bit early. Um, the state legislature tends to not have things finalized by that point. So we may have to uh, come back for a third reading at some point later in June. Um, 
And so we'll, we'll monitor that very closely and, and keep you informed as we go forward with that. Um, so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, that the board has related to the process. And um, as I said, we'll be um, bringing some more information to you here soon um, with the budget outlook. Has the county auditor given us a feel for uh, the growth of our tax base in Lexington one? Has, has Chris weighed in on that? What's it looking like? Uh, so the the county uh, assessments are actually, um, I mean, the growth is there in, yeah. in our in our community, obviously. Um, but the, the revenue picture is not really increasing as fast as we would hope that it would. Okay. Um, and so we're, uh, we just got some preliminary numbers from them on uh, actually yesterday. And so we're working through those and um, having some conversations back with them. Um, they're not exactly as high as we would have expected. We had a so. decent lift last year, a year before, right? There was a mm -hmm. bump, one of those years, which helped us. Yeah. Right. How often do you get those reports from Lexington County? The county? Yeah. Um, we usually get, uh, well, we get payments from them, obviously, um, on, on a regular basis. But we get, um, this time of year, we'll get um, one in February, uh, one in March, and then maybe uh, another one in April. Um, um, and that kind of gives us a picture of, um, you know, what, what the tax outlook looks like, the collection outlook looks like. I'm just curious, I um, always want to ask about your office's conversations about impact fees. Um, the, at the school board association meeting a couple weeks ago um, in the budget school finance presentation, um, one of the presenters was the CFO from Fort Mill. Mm -hmm. And um, they were the first in the state to kind of forage ahead with um, the impact fees, and they were, as expected, um, sued by Manufacturers Association, a couple of groups. And as far as I understand, they recently prevailed, at least at the first level. Um, and they reported out that through the first year, that the, they had netted like $23.5 million through the impact fees, that it was proving to be extremely successful. Um, are y'all... Is there any thought about talking about that with the board? And so there, there is some interest um, at the county level, at the town level, uh, and, and obviously our when we would support um, some work with that. Um, what I will tell you is that impact fees um, have very strict guidelines at, through the state, and so um, you can't just uh, levy an impact fee in general. And just say anybody moving in has to pay five thousand dollars or whatever the pick a number um, you have to have a targeted area and a targeted project um, that that impact fee can be used for uh, so for example if you knew a, a, a large development was about to occur in a certain area um, and you could you could potentially structure an impact fee for that development area and then it might you might be able to use that impact fee money to then pay for you know, a portion of the road infrastructure related to that, um, as an example. So um, it takes some pretty close coordination uh, with the school district, the county, um, possibly the town as well. Uh, but it's something that um, has been talked about, um, you know, at those levels. So, I mean, it's, there's some, some definite interest in it. But to be clear, we don't have that authority. County Council would have to do that on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So. That's a good thing for y'all to talk about when the chair and vice chair of our board meets with the county council chair and vice chair. Mm -hmm. That's a very good conversation to have. And, and one thing about that conversation, um, it's interesting, I mean, obviously, um, when you have an impact fee, you know, there's a lot of projects that need to be done in Lexington County. Uh, so then it gets into a situation of who gets the money uh, from the impact fee. So. Um, but, but it is some, some good dialogue to have. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, and so uh, our final uh, update tonight, we do have a brief operations update as well, I believe. Thank you, Dr. Little. Um, so it is a brief uh, report. I like how you led me to that. Um, and so, uh, let's see if we can get that to run in here. We got, we, mint. we got um, mints flying all over the place up here. <laughs> so uh, 
We have uh, some pictures this evening. We have a number of projects going on. As I mentioned just a few weeks ago, um, we're, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes, getting ready for our summer uh, project. So you're, you're going to see a lot of pictures coming up this summer. Um, but but at Centerville Elementary School, uh, this again is scheduled to open in August. Um, uh, we have made some progress there, despite uh, some of the weather uh, that we've we've seen recently. You'll notice that we do have brick. Uh, around the building we do have a wing now that's under roof and capped um we now have steel over the auditorium um and so we're we're getting getting there this is a prototype plan this is rocky creek uh, medical and elementary and deerfield uh, so this is the fourth time we built this plan um here's another shot we do have a lot of work to do uh, here on the front of this in, in the classroom wing here um i'd really like to see basically everything under roof at this point um but but we are are making progress every day. So, um, and that's a shot of that last classroom wing there. And uh, this is just some ground level um, shots. So, and that you're looking actually at the front entry over over here on on that side. Um, and uh, we do have some windows uh, that are going into this this classroom wing that has roof on it now. So that that'll really help us um, move forward with uh, interior finishes uh, to being able to be started. Shot of the main entrance um, area there. Uh, you can see we have some parking lot development that's occurred. We got curb and gutter and um, some stone basin. Um, and there's a you're kind of looking out from the middle of the school out the front entrance, and that's the secured foyer area there uh, that will eventually take shape. Uh, this is actually looking into the library, um, and so that may look familiar to you if you recall those other other facilities. Um, and then this is the cafeteria and the uh, the gymnasium area that's here. That that dividing wall that we've we've used in the other schools was, will be installed right there. So um, the stage area uh, for the cafeteria is right here on the on the right hand side of the shot. New Pillion Middle School, yes sir. And that's a fall opening. Great. August. August. Opening. Yes sir. Uh, that's the plan. Um, New Pillion Middle School. This school started about two weeks, uh, three weeks after. Um, the school you just looked at. Um, and so uh, this is about 210,000 square feet. Um, Centerville Elementary is about 128,000 square feet. Um, aerial shot of the, the campus there. This is based on the Beachwood Middle School prototype plan. So this gives you a view of the whole campus. Um, you can see our storm detention in, in the back here. Um, this is the rec recreation fields for the county in the Pelion area. We'll have parking on the side here, just like we do at, at Beachwood, front entry parking and drive access here. Um, our, our track and field area here is, is taking shape. Um, still have some of that um, you know, in the works. But um, this facility, we've got roof, uh, final roofing over you know, two thirds of the building. Um, and then we've we still got to cap this, but there's roof over this. Uh, brick um, and the... Um, it's called Nietzsche High, so it's a concrete um, wall panel product. Um, is wrapped basically the entire building except for the new section there. This gives you another vantage point from the back, um, looking kind of towards the front of the site. This will be the main entrance to the school. 178 is here. Um, and so um, this actually was a helicopter, not a drone. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not a, not a drone. It's a fancy drone, I guess you could say. Um, this is an interior shot. Uh, you're actually standing on the on the um, you know the second floor, looking out. The secured foyer will be here, but you can see the classroom wings um, and, and everything. Uh, you've, you guys have spent a lot of time in Beachwood, so you're familiar with kind of the, what we're looking at here. The main office is right right here um, on the left. Um, here's an exterior photo. Um, you know the you know three classroom wings. You see a lot of good progress here. Um, exterior finishes are well underway. Windows are going in. Um, this is an area between the classroom wings. Um, and this is the cafeteria. Uh, you're actually in the library looking at the cafeteria across the courtyard. Uh, big windows are going in there. Um, and then this is the front entrance. Um, canopy uh, steel that has been set. And so a lot of good progress going on there. Um, 
And that's January. That's currently a January opening. I keep telling them we could probably make August, but they keep telling me January. So Mr. Reynolds said uh, he's ready for us to come out and see it. So we yes. need some hard hats and we can go look. Yeah, so we want to schedule a, a, a visit uh, for, for those sites. Um, we also are looking to um, kick off a groundbreaking um, at our Lexington Middle School site. Um, I've got a meeting tomorrow, that, and we're going to talk about a date for that, but I anticipate that coming up sometime in, in March um, or maybe early April. Uh, f to kick off the Lexington Middle School replacement, uh, which is the uh, third school we'll build of that prototype plan. Uh, so really excited about that coming up too. Additional work in Pelion, uh, Pelion High School Athletic improvements, um, making some good progress here. Uh, this is the concession building. Um, if you, you know, the last pictures, it was a footings. Um, so they're really, really doing some good work here. This is over at the track. Um, you can see the Performing Arts Center for the middle, you know, it's the middle school building, but that's the Pelion Performing Arts Center there. This is going to be, this replaced the old concession building that was there. So this will have locker rooms and um, nice concession area um, and, you know, guest restrooms, spectator restrooms. Um, and then we move on to, uh, actually, this is behind um, Pelion High School. This is the weight room and the wrestling room addition that's occurring there. This is, you're looking at the weight room. Uh, this will actually be a roll-up door that um, allow the student athletes to come outside and do some work uh, outside of the weight room. Um, here's another look at that. This is actually the side, the wrestling room side there. Um, so making really good progress there. Um, and then this is the um, additional locker room facility at the uh, main stadium where uh, football and soccer uh, and lacrosse are played. Actually, they don't play lacrosse here at Pelion, but um, – Hopefully, eventually, they'll be able to start a team there. Um, <clears throat> but we had, we only had one locker room space um, and restroom space there for the teams. And so this is that, that second locker room space. So it's coming along very nicely as well. And of course, you can always track our um, building plan progress of all of our schools um, at the website. And uh, you'll see updates of pictures and, and improvements that we have going on across the district. That's all I've got. Okay. I just wanted to update you on our board's activities since we last saw you. We had the most amazing visit at Meadow Glen Elementary School last Friday. Um, we actually went to a class where they were speaking Mandarin, and they spoke it for, I don't know, 15 Whoa. minutes. And we had no clue what they were saying, but all those kids did. So they were speaking it. They were reading it. They were writing it with the uh, Chinese characters. It was so impressive. And we also had uh, students provide us with their assessments and they sat one-to-one -one with us and uh, showed us what they've been working on and that was so impressive to me. They were just, it was incredible. Uh, we also attended our annual conference and at our next meeting we'll be giving you some updates from that. And I would like to just thank Dr. Little and Dr. Guyton. Uh, they helped with the vaping conference at Lexington High School last week and um, Dr. Guyton has a great picture of a guinea pig. That, uh, that I think really hit home the message that our kids are guinea pigs when it comes to vaping. And um, I just really appreciate them working with that. Um, and then I think, uh, Ms. Green, you've been reading Across America. You had a really lovely wig on <laughs> that you wore for Dr. Seuss Day. <laughs> that was good. And um, as just a note of personal privilege, uh, we lost a former board member this weekend. Uh, Mr. Bobby Bowers was a long-term uh, board member here in Lexington One. He also served as the president of the South Carolina School Boards Association during his tenure, and he passed away last Saturday, and I would just like to remember him to the board and to his family because he, he uh, did a lot for the children, of, uh, not only of our district, but the children of South Carolina. And also, I want to thank Dr. Little, um, Ms. Hill, Dr. Guyton, and Dr. Powers. Um, this uh, coronavirus thing is, is just a very fluid situation, and they are really working hard to communicate with our parents. Um, Dr. Guyton, Dr. Powers are really providing um, insight into some of the medical aspects, especially Dr. Powers, because he's uh, hands on deck over at Lexington Medical Center. So it's just been... I just want to thank them for trying to get their arms around that. Um, board, is there anything else before we adjourn? Mm -hmm. No, sir. You can come up and talk with us afterwards. That, that's during citizens' participation, but you're more than welcome to come talk to us when I, when I adjourn. So give me just a second. Uh, board, we're now to 10.0. It's time to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn?
Thank you, Ms. Green. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Guyton. All in favor, please stand up and come on up.